everyone. Welcome back. Hope everyone had a good lunch. Uh, we're pleased to have Amanda for call, Carlos Morantes Ariza, and Rusty Schmidt with us today to share their case studies and practical findings in invasive species management. Amanda will present on land as a sacred trust, nurturing ecology, nourishing community. Amanda for call is the Director of Environmental Sustainability for the Sisters of St. Joseph in Brentwood. Amanda is a Long Island native who earned a Bachelor's of Science degree in Conservation Biology from SUNY ESF. She earned a Master's of Public Ed Administration from CUNY Baruch. Amanda has experience working with land trusts to preserve and protect wild places. Amanda's role with the Sisters of St. Joseph includes a variety of initiatives, including forest and meadow stewardship, woodland restoration, stormwater management, and native garden design. There are sustainable landscapes and open spaces throughout the Brentwood campus. Amanda manages this mixed landscape in a holistic way, integrating the human community with the natural community. Please welcome Amanda for call. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody's feeling good and I'm thrilled to be here today. Thank you to all our organizers and sponsors. Um, and I think we have my slides pulling up right now. Wonderful. So for those of you who don't know the Sisters of St. Joseph, they are a congregation of Catholic sisters and they have a long time spiritual connection and a growing connection with the natural world. But it was really in 2015 that they were able to formalize that. So in 2015, they affirmed a land ethics statement. What's on the screen is just a piece of it. It's about a page long. This was something that the Earth Matters community, uh, Committee formed and all 300 plus sisters at the time affirmed uh, unanimously. So I just wanna read a little bit of it to you so you get the gist of what it's all about. So as the Sisters of St. Joseph, we believe we are a part of creation, not apart from it. It talks about having how the each member of the Earth community has intrinsic value and a right to live in its natural habitat. They commit to preserve, protect, restore, and cherish biodiversity and all the species with whom we share it. And they commit that we follow these principles wherever we're located. And part of that commitment is also to understanding our bioregion and to learning about it and using whatever resources are available. So having coming to conferences like this and learning from all of you fellow practitioners here. Um, the Society for Ecological Restoration has been a really wonderful resource in that way. Um, and this is the decade, the UN decade on ecological restoration. Um, it's something we're seeing as a global community that we need to be figuring out how to restore our ecosystems. So the Society of Ecological Restoration really looks at eight principles underpinning restoration. Of course, we all know how important engaging stakeholders is, drawing on many types of knowledge. Um, and having reference ecosystems and really being informed about those, supporting the ecosystem recovery process that's already happening. I think we all in this room know that um, nature wants to recover. And so we're really there to assist and to help and foster that. Having clear goals and, and working towards that highest level of recovery that we can get to. And these gains have cumulative value. So again, I, I look around this room and think of each of us who have special places that we are caring for, that we love, and each of us together adding our little gardens, adding our little restoration projects, build up to this huge cumulative value for all of Long Island. And there's trying to get the right project in the right place, this continuum of restoration activities. And so the way that looks in Brentwood, uh, we have 212 acres that the sisters hold in sacred trust there. And there are a number of initiatives, including the garden ministry, that is really the spiritual ecological core of the property and is where we always start our, our property tours. We have 75 acres of woodlands, um, more than half of which we're in contract right now with the DEC to put under um, easement. So it'll be protected in perpetuity. We have farmlands, there's 28 acres under agricultural easement, and there are seven farms there, including the Long Island Native Plant Initiative. 
uh, we have planted seven acres of grasslands. We have dozens of native garland gardens, a solar array, and sustainable waste treatment systems. So trying to attack this from all different angles. And we're working on this restoration continuum, starting from reducing societal harms by creating our own energy on campus with the solar array, um, reducing environmental impacts by having organic farms, um, planting natives, and slowly moving towards um, initiating native recovery and always hoping for full recovery whenever possible. So with that kind of overview of what happens at Brentwood, I'd like to share with you a little bit about a specific reforestation project we've been working on um, since 2021. So like I said, um, gaining uh, many types of knowledge and putting as much information as we can from different sources to understand the best way to care for the environment. So I wanna mention, um, you know, traditional ecological knowledge and thank Shanae and Jeremy last night for all of their wisdom that they've generously shared with us. And also there's scientific discovery. So we've done forest inventory analysis on the woodlands that we do have on the property. Um, and then there's local ecological knowledge. We are lucky that um, some members of our grounds crew have been working and living on the property for 40 years. So it is a huge, amount of information in their heads about how things have been growing, what species have been there over time and the abundance. And similar with the sisters, many of them, they all started their religious lives on that property, um, some of them 40, 50, 60 years ago. So they have wonderful memories of the property and we're lucky to have an archivist on site. So you can see this, uh, it's a 1936 aerial image of the property. It looks quite different now, um, but you can see the lower half of it, there are sort of these you know, these very Pine barrens areas, which are very full now. Um, and the restoration site I'm gonna be talking about is, is right in here, um, which was an old apple orchard. Um, and I include this image of interns and myself getting our uh, feet in the moss because I think the, the acquired practitioner knowledge that on the ground observations and personal connection is so important um, to really care for a site well. And so we're using those native reference ecosystems. Um, the forest, like I said, it is slash was a, a, a pine, pine barrens forest or forest variant, um, and that is what's in the area. Hempstead Plains, of course, an important habitat on Long Island, and we see little remnants of that based on some of the species that exist at the site. And so this is an image sort of showing what the restoration site looked like the day before planting. So you can see all those pots out there. And the photo is from the woodland looking out onto this area that was lawn. So a little more history on, on the property. Um, there was agriculture on the land in the early 1900s. That's the way the sisters fed themselves. So many of them have memories of going out into the apple orchards and picking apples. And, and part of this area was apple orchard. And you can sort of see uh, there's a couple little scraggly apple trees left. Um, but for many years, as the sisters aged and the economy changed, uh, a lot of that land became lawn, those big sprawling lawns, and um, they really weren't used, and people would only be on the lawn to mow it. So that, uh, that's not a great, sometimes lawns are useful, right? Sometimes there's people recreating on them. That wasn't the case here. Um, we had a lot of moss and and not even the grass didn't even look good there so it clearly wanted to be a forest so it was a perfect site um, and you can see this data i have here is showing the biomass in the forest that's right behind the picture so it was sort of some of our baseline to understand what is in the adjacent woodland what can we expect to do well in the new forest that we're planting and you can see the majority of the biomass is pitch pines but a lot of that is standing dead um, that's 14, you can't quite see the number there, but that's 14% of the standing biomass is dead pitch pines. Um, and it's probably higher now because this data is a couple years old and we've had issues with southern pine beetle, et cetera. And there's no pitch pine regeneration in that main woodland, none. We did 22 plots and didn't find one pitch pine, you know, under 40 probably. Um, so 
it's really a changing, the woodland, the character of it is changing. It's becoming more uh, white, uh, white pine, oaks, red maple, those kind of species that can take those more mesic conditions. So really this uh, woodland restoration is an opportunity to get back some of those other species. And so important uh, everywhere, but very, uh, very much in these restoration projects is the community. Um, so we talk about stakeholder engagement. I, I like to think of it in terms of community. Um, it's become an annual tradition for us to plant trees in the spring. We have a wonderful corporate sponsor that donates native trees and shrubs and sisters and staff and community members come help us plant. Uh, and it's always something that's really valuable for me. And then I see how it impacts other people. Like one of the sisters uh, finished planting. She's in her seventies and turned to me and said, um, Amanda, that's the first time I ever planted a tree. And I was taken aback and, and maybe you are too, because in this room, I think people here, uh, we're so used to planting trees, we're planting trees constantly. Um, this is just what we're doing, where we're planting perennials or, or whatever we're doing. And we're taking this stake in our future and saying, um, this is something good we can put into the world for the next generation and the next generation. Um, and the sister in her seventies, although she's done a lot of wonderful work for the community that will span generations, hadn't had this impact on her local landscape. So we're also thinking about supporting the ecosystem recovery process. So it's great to plant the trees in there, um, but I think in some ways to me, it's just as important that we stopped mowing. <laughs> we stopped mowing, we had a reason, an excuse to stop mowing this area. Um, and what do you know it, we had pitch pines regenerating. So we have this happy little pitch pine there with dozens and dozens of pitch pines behind it. More pitch pines, in, in more maybe pitch pines actually in that picture than we have in the whole rest of 45 acres of woodlands there um, because they just can't regenerate in the conditions in that main woodland. Um, I'm getting told questions, so I went a little, went a little slow. Um, I'm gonna go really fast through the last couple of seconds. Um, so we kept those existing um, apple trees. We have all this lovely broom sedge regrowth, excuse me. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, and we're able to sort of restory the site by having, you know, this box turtle showed up and sending the picture to everybody and saying, hey, look, this box turtle is taking, um, you know, coming through this area that we planted and people felt so connected to it. And every time they drive by this site, they realize what an impact they can have on the world. And I think that protects this site by having stories with it, people are able to protect it. Um, and we've been using this um, restoration wheel to really think about how we can um, add all these different pieces in and how we're creating good restoration projects that are thinking not only about the ecological restoration, but the cultural aspects as well. All right, and I'll take questions. Hi, Amanda, Fred from Wild Ones. Thank you again for that great tour you gave us and to see the uh, grass restoration with the dragonflies flying over it. Very impressive that it was only three years old. Uh, I think at the time we saw you were starting the um, forest restoration. So going forward, uh, what type of maintenance or um, additional processes of plants and such will you be thinking you'll put in? Because right now it's an open woodland, right? So uh, what do you see it developing into over time? Thank you for that, Fred. Um, so part of it is monitoring, I didn't get to say, but we planted a wide diversity of species in there. And so some of it is just seeing what does well, what doesn't do well in wet years, dry years, and then adjusting because we're planting every year, planting different species. And in some cases, we're filling in spots where things died and didn't make it. Um, although a lot of play, a lot of things are doing quite well. Um, and also trying to create sort of microhabitats. So if we notice, hey, the you know these sedges are doing great here, we'll intentionally not shade them out and leave gaps um, and have that uh, micro topography in there. All right, thank you.
All right. Thank you to Amanda. If anyone has not been to the Sisters of St. Joseph, I would encourage them to go give it a visit. Not only the shameless plug for Lizma and Lin P, but Amanda and their crew do amazing work and the sisters for generations doing that work. So thank you to her. Uh, next up is Carlos Morantes Ariza discussing our only aquatic invasive species topic of the day in his presentation, modeling population dynamics for targeted water chestnut management. Carlos received his Bachelor in Biology from the University National de Colombia in 2014. Carlos has wor worked on a range of different research topics, including clinical research, behavioral ecology of Apis mellifera, a species of honeybee, and spatial distribution of invasive plant species in Colombia. Carlos is interested in understanding the emergence of patterns in biological systems, especially at the community level. Currently, Carlos is a PhD student at in the Theoretical Ecology Lab at the Stony Brook University Ecology and Eva Evolution Program. He studies the dynamics that create and sustain biodiversity by implementing computational tools such as deep learning algorithms and system modeling. Carlos currently serves as the coordinator of Aquatic Invasive Species Program for the DC on Long Island. Please welcome Carlos. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carlos Brandt. I am the Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator for uh, Region 1 at the DC. And yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about potential management strategies for water chestnut in Long Island using population dynamic models. So we're going to talk about what the problem with kind of... It goes, I like to move around. Yeah, I don't, I cannot move much. Anyway, so this is the thing. It's okay. So we're going to talk about what the problem with water chestnut is, um, what our goal is, thank you, what our goal is, uh, and we're going to talk about what can we do in the specific ecological conditions of Long Island, what should we do about it, which are not necessarily the same thing, right? And how can we inform the, that difference using population dynamic models? in order to create realistic expectations about the future of the problem and how we are going to address it, okay? So first, uh, well, this is Massapequa Lake in uh, July 31st, 2023. This is a, an aerial shot of, um, of, water chestnut, of the water chestnut invasion. And as you can see, all of this green is water chestnut. Basically, it has covered up to 40% of the lake area, right? And the problem is that it's high abundance in not only Massapequa Lake, but other uh, water bodies in Long Island, prevents these lakes from providing the ecological services that you know, we all rely on. And our goal then is to develop a sustainable strategy uh, for water chestnut population control. Now, what can we do then about this problem? How can we achieve that goal? Well, first we have several tools at hand that we have learned you know, throughout the years. One is manual pooling done by volunteers every year. We have mechanical pooling by harvester that uh, to date, it's operated by Nassau County. We have the always controversial um, herbicide application option, and we have other less traditional um, options, such as installing uh, benthic barriers to prevent or to reduce the area that the plant can actually use, right? Now, let me talk to you about the different degrees of one of these alternatives. So this is Massapequa Lake, the same lake as you saw in the last slide in 2018, in June 2018. As you can see, it's highly invaded, all this region, or all this area is water chestnut, and a harvester was brought in. There was a harvesting process, and as you can see, it basically cleared out the lake. I think it looked pretty good. And we could say, hey, that's a, that's, you know, that's a, a good management strategy. However, as you saw in the previous slide, in 2023, we had a situation equally or worse than this one, right? Does that mean that the mechanical harvester doesn't work? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means that we have to learn how to use it in an optimal way, right? Now, in an optimal way to do what? To achieve, again, our goal, which is develop a sustainable strategy for water chestnut population control, sustainable being the key word of this goal, right? That means that we need to know how many people, for instance, are we going to devote in manual pooling? How many times are we going to use a harvester? For how long, how many years do we need to use a harvester? How do we combine all these potential factors, right? And in the end, is this going to be cost effective? Is this going to be time effective? Not for a year, not for two years, but for many, many years. As you know, invasive species like to come back, 
right? And they are going to come back. So we need to have a strategy that is flexible enough and efficient enough so we can answer to these problems whenever they show up. Now, let's talk a little bit about the model. Don't wor do not worry about the map. This is a very simple version. I see some heads moving around like that. It's okay. So this is the thing. This is the basic thing. This model predicts what is going to be the abundance of water chestnut next year, depending on several factors. Basically, how many water chestnut plants we have this year, how many plants, how many new plants are going to have for each of those plants, and all these little weird thing here is how many plants the, the lake can have. That's it. Where do we have agency here? We have agency here in how many uh, plants the lake can foster by reducing the available area, for instance, using benthic barriers. But also, and the most important, I think, is we have agency in the pooling process. We can reduce effectively the number of plants every year by a coordinated pooling effort, right? So let's talk a little bit about the pooling. Again, don't worry about the math. I'll, I'll get back to that. So in a, pooling, in, a, in, a, in a pooling effort a year, we have people pooling, right? And we have harvesters pooling. Now, those two things do not behave equally. They have different behaviors, and we have to take that into account, right? Also, we could think about reducing the area, as I mentioned before. Now, let's talk a little bit about the pooling. If you have never been in a pooling, I urge you to come. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a joyful process, and it, it, it is very rewarding. We regularly start pooling, you know, all happy, you're optimistic, you know, it's summer, it's a nice day. But when you start pooling in the summer and the heat, like, you know, the, the, the environment is pretty hot, you know, it, it takes a toll on you. So our maximum rate of pooling, which is here in this y-axis, decreases with the time, with the passage of time. So by the third or fourth hour, there's no way that you're pulling anything efficiently. And we go from that state to a state of absolute exhaustion, right? Which means we have to learn how to effectively use the, the time that people are giving us, right? That is key in this process in order to make, this, to make it sustainable. What about the, the harvester? Well, there are several assumptions underlying this, this little plot, but this basically means that the more hours you have in operation, the more plants you take. Basically, the harvester doesn't get tired, right? It doesn't get tired. Uh, we are assuming that it has a maximum and optimal pooling rate, and the density of plants in the lake is compatible with that uh, rate. That's it, right? Now, once we have those things, and I cannot talk about other factors, but let's focus on those two factors of pooling. Now we can ask, okay, what are our realistic expectations with different uh, combinations? So maybe uh, let's, let's ask what's gonna happen in 10 years. So you're gonna see in the x-axis 10 years span and in the y-axis basically how much water chestnut you have. So let's say you ask me, hey, Carlos, what if I don't, don't do anything, zero pooling? Well, if you give me zero pooling, in a few years, actually in 2.5, well, three years, because it's an annual plan, you're going to have the lake completely covered as much as it can be covered, right? So it's gonna saturate. Okay, that's our null expectation. If we don't do anything, that should happen. Okay, let's get some volunteers here. Let's bring 150 people to pull one year, okay, for four hours. What do we have? Do you see the blue line? That little blue line is the effect of 150 people pulling four hours during a year. It's basically nothing, right? You're not making a dent. You tell me, okay, but you know what? We have the harvester and it doesn't get tired. So what happens if I throw in a harvester? So let's say you go from zero hours here to 54 hours here. And let's throw some volunteers there to pull. What if we throw not 150 in green, but we throw 350 in blue? The only thing that we're gonna do in this scenario is delay the process of full colonization of the lake. So we know that this strategy doesn't work. And we can keep asking, wait, what if I ask more, what if I add more hours? What if I add more harvesters? What if I add, and you can start playing with that. And you can, you will get infinite numbers of answers to that. And it's fairly hard to navigate. But the thing with the management strategy is that, it's, is that it has to be bounded in a, in a particular time window, right? So for now, let's ask a question just for the sake of, of this presentation. How could we get the problem under control in three years? Let's focus on all these potential scenarios. And as you can see, it's pretty hard to follow. So let's check uh, a summary of that. Don't worry, I'll walk you through this plot. So what, the, what we have here is the potential outcomes in three years combining different degrees of strategies, right? Green means the lake is fully invaded. 
blue or purplish means that we'll, we're good. Either we completely got rid of it or we reduce the abundance, right? So we want to be in blue. And these columns, like this, each of these plots represent how many hours the harvester is working. So in the first plot, it's working 54 hours. In the second, 60, and so on until 72. In this little x-axis, you have zero volunteers here, 350 volunteers here, and you have very slow volunteers pulling almost none plants per hour to very efficient volunteers pulling up to 800 plants per hour, which is a realistic number. Now, let's see what happens. If, let's say you ask me, hey, I have 66 hours of a harvester operation. How many volunteers do I need to get the problem under control in three years? So I'm going to tell you, okay, you need, with 66 hours, you need at least, at least 250 volunteers working four hours in the whole year that pull very, very fast. Very, very fast. 800 plants per hour is fast. 600 is more the, the, the observed value. So let's say you have volunteers that pull this at uh, this ratio. So if you follow this line of 600, you will find yourself in this region, the blue that we want. This is a clear lake or a controlled population of water chestnut, which has, which requires 250 people pulling four hours every year for three years and 72 hours of operation of a harvester at its optimal rate. Okay, so again, the final, the final um, lesson that we can learn from this is that we have a map to answer the question, why do I need what do I need to get rid of this problem in a specific time frame? How much is it going to cost me? If I want to reduce costs of F or effort in one aspect, how much should I compensate on the other, right? Which means we have a realistic expectation of how this problem is going to go. We can actually answer what happens if we don't do anything, right? And this is a very important tool because, you know, people put a lot of effort every year going and pulling. It's a little taxing. taxing. Um, and you know, the harvester, of course, it doesn't operate for free. So we have to make the best of it. And we can, we shouldn't be doing it blindly uh, because, you know, every effort comes from a very good place and uh, we should make the best of it just, you know, out of valuing it. So now what is our plan then, now that we have this map? Well, the plan is to start operating on these different factors, right? Maximizing the efficiency of each of those uh, potential uh, tools that we have by doing what? Well, we, well, what we can do best, bringing people, raising awareness, and bringing people actually to cooperate in the pooling effort, which means we need a lot of volunteers that can come from different agencies. At least I know that we <laughs> come with you every year. Uh, but also like, you know, other, other sources. Also, the local community should be involved. Even if local businesses, for example, cannot go and pull themselves, maybe they can help us to raise awareness, to bring more people in. Maybe we, they can, you know, blend resources, whatever it is. But for now, the main, the main thing that we need are volunteers. Where do we want to get them from? Everywhere. But we are uh, prioritizing getting students, high school seniors involved in this. You, um, you know, calling for help from uh, different high schools in Nassau and Suffolk County. Actually, we already have our first group of volunteers. Uh, it's gonna be 30 students from uh, West Babylon High School they are going to come on May 31st to do the first poll. And we're going to use every iteration of this process during this year to further inform the model, because the model is a representation of reality and we want to make it as reliable as possible, which means we need data. So we are going to learn over the, you know, over the March, we are going to learn what, how can we improve the model so we can improve our prediction and we can be more efficient in the use of our resources. So bottom line, we want all of you involved in the process. If you know someone that knows someone that can recommend a group of volunteers, by all means, please reach us. We, well, I should have, an, a, you know, <laughs> something to, for people to sign on, but you know, I will be around and I will ask people. So uh, please, if you know someone again, just let me know. I will be there, I will stay in touch, and we will move this initiative further. This is gonna happen, but it would be better if it happens with, you know, the sum effort of all of us. Uh, having said that, I want to thank you, you know, all the team at the DEC. Uh, well, there's a lot of people, I'm not going to mention them, but I do want to um, thank the, the DEC itself, uh, Stony Brook University, the Department of Environmental, uh, the Department of Ecology and Evolution, don't tell them I said that. 
and the theoretical ecology lab, which is the place where this model came from. Uh, having said that, if you have any questions, I will be happy to. Excuse me. We have time for a question. Anyone have a question? Is this on? Yep. Okay. Thanks, Carlos, for the talk. Um, one quick question about the model and predictions from year to year. Is there any incorporation for what is left in the seed bank as water chestnut seeds could last for up to a decade in a seed bank? Well, that is a really good question. And I, am I, can, can you, sorry, this is in case somebody asks difficult questions. So yes, there is an assumption. There's an assumption about the seed bank. So we know that, we know that uh, water chestnut seeds can survive up to 10 years. It doesn't mean that all of them reach the 10 year mark surviving, right? But since we don't have enough information about the, how the seed bank behaves, we had to make assumptions about the growth rate of the population itself. We made it higher than one, which means that there is always a nexus of new plants coming from where? The seed bank. However, today we do not have an expectation, a clear expectation about how that seed bank gets exhausted, which is what we are aiming for. We have a couple of experiments this year that we would like to test to see if we can increase the speed of exhaustion of the seed bank. But so far, the information, like the additional effect of the seed bank is in the model. However, we are not modeling the dynamics of the seed bank itself. But is there to some extent? Did I answer your question? Great, thank you. Yes. All right, thank you, Carlos, very much. Um, next, we have Rusty Schmidt to share a presentation on Lespedizia cuneata efficacy study. Um, Rusty is in a rather quiet looking shirt today, but Rusty is a landscape ecologist with Nelson Pope and Voorhees and an adjunct professor in the horticultural department at Farmingdale State University. Rusty designs and constructs alt alternative methods for managing stormwater runoff and has created hundreds of designs for habitat restorations, rain gardens, and sustainable landscaping, ranging in the size from small backyards to large campuses and parks throughout the nation. Rusty has written a number of invasive species management plans and conducted invasive species research and management. Rusty is the co-author for three books, two on plant selections for stormwater management and a homeowner guide to rain gardens. Please welcome Rusty Schmidt. <laughs> All right, thank you. I like the woos, by the way. I, I got to say that's kind of is a kind of is a inspirational as I'm stamping up here. And uh, I think, thank you for noticing my toned down shirt. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, here it is. So, uh, uh, Lespedeza canida is, is kind of newish to uh, Long Island. Uh, it is uh, um, throughout most of Long Island. Um, it is here and there and everywhere, but when it does show up, it seems to be coming in more and more abundance. And um, we, I got asked to do a uh, work on a project site, and um, and and when we started to work on it, I, it just came in to be more and more problems. And so in that time period, we we created a test uh, system. So what I'm doing here is uh, it's just one year of data. Do not trust that this is uh, by far uh, the best data in the world yet. But it's uh, I would like to share what we've uh, discovered so far. Uh, first thing is um, uh, this Lespedeza canida is. Uh, native to Asia and Eastern uh, Australia. It is, uh, was introduced because of the erosion control, uh, for erosion control practices. Um, it's long lived um, uh, and, uh, various, uh, and has very established rhizomes and a really deep taproot as well. Um, it spreads rapidly and it outcompetes most of our native species. Um, it it's thought to have tannins that um, um, has, uh, that is, uh, changing the soil chemistry, and the tannins also render it kind of ungrazable. So it's kind of like the perfect invasive species. Um, also, to add to that, it's got, oh, wait, one more thing. It's, you know, pretty pink flowers. I got to throw that in there. Um, large numbers of seeds uh, spread by uh, water, wind, um, and animal transport. It remains, uh, the seeds are very viable for a very long time, uh, adding to the seed bank. Um, and the height of the plant is somewhere between three to five feet tall um, and can shade out our native plants uh, below it. 
So, you know, it, and <laughs> one more thing, it takes up a lot of water. So it's very drought resistant because of its trout, uh, drought, uh, because of its taproot, but uh, it still uh, takes in as much water as it possibly can and actually dries out the plants around it. So, um, and its favorite habitat is um, poor soils, like uh, our good sandy soils here in Long Island. So it's kind of back to, it really is one of the best uh, invasive species that we can try to fight. Um, well, that was really slow. Um, so uh, anyway, so uh, the first thing I, of course, whenever I come across a plant that I don't know as much about as I'd like is I started doing the research. And the research uh, was showing that the, the first thing, of course, is prevention. Well, I have a site that already has it on the property. So it, prevention was uh, was not going to happen. However, part of the prevention is, is that I'm cutting off the seed heads every year so that I'm not adding to the seed bank. That's about as I, all I could do for that. One of the cultural controls is fertilization. Um, they're finding uh, the actually one of the best ways to manage this species is actually add fertilizer, increase the, species, uh, the organic rates, and it really decreases this plant. That's really cool for an agricultural field. My site is not that. It is a, um, a pine barrens barrens uh, and, uh, and it's a an, uh, meadow system and it just doesn't have that opportunity. Uh, physical control, digging it up is pretty ineffectual. Um, it usually makes more. Um, mowing tends to make more, but it does set it back. So setting it back, uh, keeping it from going to seed is really good. It kind of holds it in place, but uh, the plant itself tries to put up more shoots. Uh, biologic control, goats and cattle have had some minor success, but again, back to it has tannins and it's not very uh, grazable. Um, and uh, the, uh, the Lespedes of webworm, which really attacks it and really does a really good job, also attacks our native um, uh, less pedizes. So it's kind of part of the problem. So um, chemical, con chemical controls, there seems to be no single control for herbicide. And uh, really what all of the research has kind of said is that this integrative um, uh, approach of showing has been, really been the showing the best option of doing a whole bunch of different things. But you notice that there's a few things that are not in our repertoire of techniques. Smothering is not in there. Plowing is not in there. There's a few other options uh, that, we are, that we've also considered. So um, the, the subject property, um, uh, before I get to subject property, there's nine native uh, Lespedezas uh, here on Long Island. Two are considered rare and two are considered endangered species. Um, and, and then with those nine species, there's a bunch of uh, subspecies of variants. Um, and so there's a, a variety of uh, Lespedezas. The one that most people know, the most common Lespedeza on Long Island is the, uh, the round-headed bush clover. So, okay. Um, then, uh, and I found a couple of these uh, uh, Lespedezas on my subject property. Uh, the subject property was, um, uh, is part of a development. It is um, part of the rules of the development was that they needed to put in a meadow um, and, uh, and a buffer along uh, a pine barrens area. And so it really is creating a pine barrens barrens of a meadow. Um, and uh, in that meadow, it's about 40% native plants that were seeded and 60% of Lespedeza. And, you know, got to throw in some mugwort in there too. Um, control to date has been really just mowing. And, um, and because of the natives that are already in there, uh, broad, for, uh, broad applications of herb herbicides was not an option. Um, broad application of fertilization is not an option because it ruins the soil for our native plants. And um, plowing is, uh, was not recommended in, uh, in some, um, because again, our native plants. And if we're gonna do that, it really starts everything back over starting from scratch. So we really wanted to think about how can we control this plant and really, really started to think about um, small areas and looking at. And so what we wanted to do first is test a bunch of different uh, techniques and we're gonna try small areas to, to begin with. So um, this is my uh, test area, all these uh, beautiful green 
upright plants. That's the Lespedeza. Um, and, um, and one of the things, I guess the two plants that it can get confused with is mugwort and, um, and ragweed. Um, so uh, the difference is, is that uh, this plant is, um, puts up a stem, it has leaves all the way up the stem. The top third of the plant has the flowers and goes to seed. Um, and, um, uh, and then as it matures, it gets more and more stems. And so it come, turns into almost like a little bush. Um, so we looked at our uh, little project area and we, and we really tried to uh, uh, figure out uh, a, a number of test plots. And um, this is our original uh, uh, project testing. Um, we looked at, uh, we, we, we broke this into f uh, five different uh, possibilities. It has a nice tall fence around it. So we took out some deer and other variables and we're really, really looking at just what is the applications that we're gonna, we're gonna try. So um, plot one, um, we, we used an herbicide. It was a 1.5 con uh, percent concentration of Accord, which is a um, glyphosate uh, product. Um, and um, <laughs> my favorite technique, somebody said the bloody glove. My, my, my same thing is we used a white glove. Uh, we, we were wiping the plants individually so that we could avoid uh, dropping herbicide on the native plants that were surrounding them. Uh, number two was uh, uh, triclopyr, a different uh, different herbicide, and again the white glove uh, treatment. Uh, uh, area three was a control spot, so we can keep we can watch and see how th how the whole site is changing and progressing overall. Number four was a uh, smother technique. So what we did is we cut it down to about four inches and put a big tarp over it and uh, covered it up, uh, staked it in. And then uh, five was literally hand pull. So we were out there hand pulling the site. Uh, so um, uh, again, here's our site. You can see the tarp at number four on the far side. The tarp actually dictated our size of all of our plots so that the plots are all the same size. Uh, the, the tarp was, um, uh, was a 30 by 30. So we, all of our plots are about 900 square feet. Um, and then you can see that uh, I got my favorite uh, weeding tool, which is a Pulaski. Um, and so we were, uh, to get after that taproot, we were really trying to get out, uh, 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 cutting it down really low and getting it, uh, pulling it all out. And uh, here's uh, this Lespedeza right here. Um, and then here's my white glove treatment. Um, uh, we have... Uh, uh, we dip. Uh, we have a rubber glove, cloth glove over the top. Dip your cloth gloved hand in herbicide, and when, whatever you touch um, uh, is being treated, um, and whatever isn't touched is uh, protected. And you can see just a couple weeks later that the plant was turning yellow, so it was working. Um, we uh, have visited the site four four times since. Um, uh, to check uh, and, and helping us kind of understand what was working and to what extent. Um, and so we treated in 2022 um, and then, uh, and none of the Lespedeza survived the treatments. Um, and then, uh, then in, uh, we went back out three times in 2023. We have not done any treatments since then. We're coming up with the plan. We have a whole management plan we're gonna jump into in 2024. So um, the first thing we, we did is you'll notice that um, we only had in, uh, in mid-May, we only had 6.3 and 6.1% regrowth from our two herbicide treatments. That meant that over 90% of the, of the plants have uh, perished through herbicide. Uh, uh, the control plot actually went down. Um, we had 82% 80, growth. That means that some plants died over the winter. We cannot explain that part. And it was kind of true for the entire property. Um, the tarp area, we had 28% and a uh, hand pull is 12.7. 28% for the tarp was actually our, our, worst, uh, our worst indicator. And it had nothing to do with the tarp. What was happening is uh, the wind took the tarp and we had a lot of plants coming around the edges. And so uh, we needed to do some over, over, uh, overwork on that. But you can see even hand pull had a, a significant impact. All those numbers went up a little bit in uh, in June, 
Um, and so some things came back a little later, um, but uh, that was, uh, and so it, all the numbers uh, kind of increased, but you can see that the TARP increased the most, and that was really, again, things moved. Uh, and then here's my last piece here. Um, what we ended up doing is that uh, we went back in August and all the numbers have significantly jumped up, double or triple, and that's mainly from the seed bank or recruitment from uh, the rhizomes. So it was the little plants. And so we really saw that we had a good impact on the uh, mature plants, but the, the little plants were the ones that came back uh, and coming back. And, our, and so what we're really trying to do now is that we're planning on going back out um, uh, we're gonna, uh, the herbicide seemed to have the, uh, a good impact. It had the least, it had our best cost per um, um, impact uh, uh, solution where hand pulling was just w way more labor intensive than just wiping. So uh, we're still going, uh, <laughs> we're still um, working on uh, getting everything else uh, caught up now. So we're working on uh, final management tools and I totally am over time. So I got to stop here right before the, the chain comes out and yanks me off. We have time for one question. Thank you. Um, that was really ed educational. What was the weeding tool called again? <laughs> so my favorite tool for weeding is called a Pulaski. It's um, uh, a pickaxe size handle. Uh, on one side has a hoe blade and the other side has an ax handle. It's, um, I, it's used for fire actually. And uh, it's uh, one of my favorite tools for uh, doing any kind of weeding. Thank you so much.